Welcome to this episode of Geospatial Distancing. My name is Abby Lehman and I am your unruly host. This is the second part of our back-to-back -back series of episodes that feature panelists from Esri. And we are talking about the work that we do within the geospatial industry and how and where we will do that work following the workplace upheaval that came along with the COVID pandemic. Last week, we had Bo Laguerre from Esri on the show discussing the technical challenges of doing our work remotely day in, day out. Today, we're gonna to continue the discussion on workplace challenges, but today we're gonna to look at it from the top down. In other words, what is the view from the bird's eye perspective um, and how do you tackle these changes from a leadership perspective at an organizational level? It's an honor to be joined by the panelists for today's show who ti whose titles float very high above my pay grade for now. Our first panelist is an established leader in the remote sensing and geospatial industry. In his current role at Esri, he serves as the Director of Global Remote Sensing and Imagery, and he spent a lot of time in this industry, traveling, living, working across the globe. I am, of course, talking about Mr. Richard Cook. Richard, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I'll give you the opportunity to greet our live virtual audience today. Well, hello, Abby Dabby Doo, and everybody out there in uh, webinar land. Good to see y'all. Now, to myself and colleagues, Richard is a bit of a familiar face, and what that really means is that I had a handful of fun facts and anecdotes to choose from when I was pulling together this introduction, but I'm going to go with this. The work in his photography portfolio is crisp and stunning, and it goes beyond what anyone would consider a hobby, although he considers that it is just that. Uh, his style is the ultimate juxtaposition of a wardrobe filled with cowboy hats and boots and the fact that he wears them while zooming around behind the wheel of a black and red Mini Cooper. Now, our second panelist today is also a colleague. He serves as the Director of Commercial Solutions at L3 Harris Geospatial. He played semi-pro baseball and he has the knees to prove it. Before taking his current role, he held several other director level positions at L3 Harris in utility solutions and my personal favorite, marketing communications. He's a Colorado native with a master's from CU Boulder. He's an avid CrossFitter and he prefers green chili over red and red wine over white. He's also a father of five, which means that someone is always keeping him on my toes, on his toes, on his toes. <laughs> <laughs> Your toes. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Dan Gradell to the show. Would you like to say hello to our audience? Yes, Abby. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Gradell. Very, I'm super happy you're all joining us today. I'm excited about today's topic. And lastly, before we dive in, I want to introduce my marketing colleague, our resident L. Woods lookalike, Ms. Matria Grazing. Please say hello, Matria. Hello. Ma did you get a kick out of that? Matria, <laughs> Matria is responsible for monitoring questions coming in from the audience and directing them to our panel. And remember, you can submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A button that's along the bottom of your screen. A recording of this discussion is gonna be available uh, following the live broadcast, along with recordings from previous episodes and links to register for upcoming live events at harrisgeospatial.com slash geospatial distancing. Now, for those of you that have been a part of geospatial distancing before, you know that the conversations we have on this show are very informal and a shift from the standard webinar that everybody knows and loves. But given the high profile guests that we have on today's show, I'm gonna do something a little bit different and I'm gonna up the ante a little bit and add a brief disclaimer to preface the whole conversation. Both Richard and Dan, they're here at my request, my personal request. They're former colleagues, current. Um, and because of that, I feel it's important to mention that neither are here representing their organizations as an official spokesperson. The thoughts and opinions that they express are their own. So as much as reading that disclaimer out loud makes me feel like a hall monitor, I think it's worth taking the time to do it because after all, geospatial distancing is my house and I want all my guests to feel welcome in my home. Now, there are many places that our conversation today could start, but I wanna begin with one of the most fundamental and noticeable changes to our workplace. And that is the abrupt shift away from doing work in a shared office space in this world gone remote. I don't want to spend too much time on, on this basic topic because it's something that we covered in a bit more technical detail in previous episodes. 
But in an organizational level, this really shook loose a lot of norms regarding, regarding work from home. And Richard, this is particularly a big deal at your organization, at Esri, because it broke a very long-standing policy. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think uh, Esri has long valued the, the idea and the concept of, of organic collaboration. You know, we talk a lot at Esri about the team of teams concept. Uh, Jack is um, very, very um, um, resolute in his belief that um, that organic interchange of, of ideas and, and, and just even the, the, the almost incidental things that you learn by interacting with one another face to face is, is kind of invaluable. And, and when you, everybody went home and started working over a video camera and, and zoom, you sort of had to stop, stop and step back and think, okay, well, how do we not lose that? How do we not, how do we maintain the ability to get that value uh, without having that direct, uh, you know, that direct day-to-day -day interaction? Um, and and as, the, as this has drug on a little bit, and as we've started to think about where the future is going to take us, the, the need to answer that question permanently has, has started to percolate up because it's, it's becoming more and more clear that we're not going to be back in the office in large numbers anytime soon, at least from an Esri perspective. And, and so we have to think about how we, are, how we can be more intentional about capturing that. Yeah, and you know, something that we kind of talked about when we were planning for this discussion and, and you and Dan both had some thoughts on was what you mentioned, which is that knowledge transfer piece. Um, you know, that was previously fostered in a shared physical workspace. Um, you know, how do you take that on? I, you guys were talking about anecdotes of, you know, walking the halls and that it's yep. important for employees and their leaders. Um, you know, it's essential to talk to new hires coming in into an organization or even the industry for the first time. Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, and I really like the way Richard phrased that, right? Richard and I probably grew up, as many of us did, in an environment where being in the office was expected. Um, and it was a way you actually got mentorship and you learned from people and you know how they work and go about their day. And with all this that has happened, it's kind of been forced upon leadership to look at new ways and evaluate our previous biases about the value of being in an office, the value of a water cooler. But now we really have to look at technology as a platform like the water cooler to not only do our work, but to create some of those social dynamics that are so important in our relationships as coworkers, uh, with customers. You know, it's changed the dynamic. You know, many of us, are used to hopping on a plane, you go have those face-to-face, -face, you meet with your customers, you really get to know them. The value of that relationship now is probably more important than it's ever been uh, from a customer perspective because here we are, we all happen to be lucky enough to know each other and, and work together. So it's, it's kind of a natural organic, to use Richard's term, capability that technology is allowing us to do. But now, you know, new employees come in, you have to work a little bit harder, have to be more cognizant about those culture beliefs that organizations have um, and how do you continue those, but you have to adapt. You have to gonna be a little more agile, I think, in how you develop those relationships and how you lead not only yourself through change like COVID, but how your organization manages that as not just a destination, but a journey. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I was, Putting this all together, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the example of they always say, like, your best thoughts are in the shower. It's really not about a shower, right? It's really about, you know, that's when your brain is not actively trying to solve a problem. Um, you know, and I think a lot of times the relationships and the networking we have uh, in that shared physical space, they happen by chance and they happen because you're not actively problem solving. But, you know, how many times do you run into someone and it sparks a solution to something or it makes you think about something in a different way or you start making connections um you know with those opportunities being missed how do we bridge that gap well i think you're you're hitting on something uh abby and, and dan talked about you know a, a lot of really good technology has come along in the last particularly even the last five years 
that are actually, I mean, you could, you could say, look, if COVID had happened 10 years ago, we would be in a much, much worse situation. Um, there are technologies that, um, there are technologies that are, are making this workable today. But, you know, I think we've, we've long had this kind of undercurrent discussion uh, in our society going on, not to get too philosophical, but uh, society going on uh, around how, how far can technology take us, right? When does technology uh, become the barrier to progress rather than, than the uh, enabler of progress? And, you know, you see this a lot with, um, uh, with discussions around how um, or, or even little vignettes on Saturday Night Live where everybody's sitting in a room and they're not talking to one another. They're looking at their phone and they're texting to one another around the, around the room instead of, having, <laughs> instead of having that human contact. And I think that's the question we're going to be answering over the next year, right? Because I think we're, we're human beings, right? We crave that contact. And, and even, if, even, if it's, even if it's just kind of that momentary conversation around the water cooler or that aha moment, as you mentioned, Abby, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see if technology can genuinely replace that. Um, I don't know. It'll, it'll be an interesting time to, to see how far it can take us. Dan, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, what, uh, what it prompted me to think about is um, generationally how, depending you know, Gen X and where you sit, in, in those hierarchies of generations, how you handle and are used to dealing with change from a technology standpoint. Um, whereas, you know, I'll put myself in the category, you know, I grew up fax machine and phone calls. Um, that's how I started my career. Uh, my children are going to start their career in this particular environment with Zoom calls and onboarding that. And so Richard's right. The technology that we're going to see that sticks in the next five years will really determine, I think, the future of the workplace because those technologies that we use in the next five years to build those relationships, to better communicate, collaborate, really will drive us all forward. Um, so they're an enablement part of, I think, what we need to do is companies that are leading their people towards a destination and objectives and building your organizations and companies. So it becomes a nice platform, but you have to be intentional and I think think through how you best use those because otherwise we will miss the water cooler. We will miss the aha moment. And I don't think anybody's not thinking we're not going to solve this problem. Um, I think it's a matter of time. We're all, I believe I'm an optimist. I think most people see that horizon. We just don't know the timing of it. Um, but saying it's solved, we still may have different dynamics that we're used to now. You know, we've, we've proven we can be very productive. I think, uh, with all this, uh, not a lot of people missed a boat. Organizations reacted very fast. Uh, and those who were ahead of the curve, I think probably did better when they had people hooked up to work from home, to be remote. Um, so now it changes the dynamic because you can decide about a global talent pool that's available to you that may not have been based on previous biases. Right. So I'm, I'm noticing Sean Cullen made a comment in the, in the chat that I thought was interesting about there being two sides of this interaction. You know, he's saying that now that, now that he's working at home, has, has fewer distractions, he's able, he's able to set up meetings with some of the experts in the office and, new, and learn new things internally. And I, I think that's fantastic. And, and Sean, I think that speaks to, um, you know, some initiative you're taking. Um, but I would, I would say that when I said earlier that we have to be intentional about it, that's exactly what I was talking about. And, and so we're talking about this from not the responsibility of the folks on our teams to, to show that initiative. We're talking about it from the responsibility of us as leaders to uh, ensure that whether we're using technology or whether we're just being intentional about uh, facilitating those connections that's I, I see that as a big part of my responsibility so a lot of a lot of what we've done is we've gone to more regular uh, we've gone to more regular team meetings and interactions you know generally I'm not a big meeting guy because a lot of times I think meetings are just they can just be filler if you you can get into this pattern and, and you're really not accomplishing anything but now just just to be intentional about making those connections um, 
and I think another way uh, that, that I think you can be intentional is, um, you know, think, think twice about email. I've personally never been a big fan of email uh, because for a lot of reasons, but one is I think it does tend to create the unnecessary separation. And, and, and so from that standpoint, Zoom's great because you're right, it, just as Sean's pointing out, you can get a captive audience one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And even though you may be over the ether from one another, you're, you're still getting the value of having that one-on-one -on -one time that you might not otherwise get. Um, so I always tell people, you know, pick up, the pick up the Zoom and call me. No, pick up the phone. Pick up the Zoom and call <laughs> me, right? Don't send me an email. Pick up the Zoom and call me. Um, so, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're pretty on top of it then, making Zoom jokes and whatnot, right? Well, I try. <laughs> I, I mean, think you just created their new tagline, Richard. Zo just zoom it. Just zoom yeah. me. Zoom me. We do have a question here from the audience. Um, do you think that there are personalities or learning styles that are adapt more easily to communication through technology? Learning styles? Uh, yeah, well, okay, so it's really interesting you asked this question because one of the things that I've done, and, and my team is doing this tomorrow, is we're, we're having a seminar um, uh, specifically around the topic of personality styles, learning styles, communication styles, and, and, and it's kind of broken up into two parts. Most of you have heard of these things if you've been through Myers-Briggs or, or, or DISC or any of these types of um, survey techniques um, that help you understand, you know, your own individual communication style, learning style, working style, personality traits. Um, but we're, we're really focusing on in our in our seminar tomorrow with my team we're focusing on not understanding ourselves but but understanding the our teammates and understanding how you know they may be they may have different ways of communicating assimilating information um you know i may be an, an extrovert they may be an introvert whatever the combination may be and and trying to help my team develop strategies for uh, tailoring how they interact with that individual to make them more comfortable, to make them more productive. Yeah, I, that's an interesting question. Um, and it points to me as one of the things I, I thought about in preparation for this uh, Zoom meeting with everybody today was, you know, some of the fundamentals of leadership. Uh, and I think what you're talking about is self-awareness, right? Not only about yourself and your strengths and weaknesses and how you communicate and what works for you to be communicated to. But with all the technology and what we're having to do, understanding your teammates better than ever and how they need to get information from you um, to be on the same page and getting the team rolling in the same direction becomes critical. Um, so, you know, whether that's video, that's writing, it's hands-on. Those are the primary learning skills that we all have, which ones work better for others. Um, so I think it's funny you say that, Richard. We have a similar meeting with our team uh, looking at the Myers-Briggs and other things. So I bet other people are doing it too because they've noticed another an opportunity to reinforce the, the strength of the team and how, as leaders, we have to lead ourselves through this challenge. Yeah, and I'm wondering too, I mean, that's talking about current employees. What about people that are just coming in? I mean, how do you... That's harder. The wow. interview process alone, I mean... Uh, the standards that we use for judging a quality candidate and the skills we use to assess that, um, that's, I mean, how do you even approach that? Dan, do you wanna go first or? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, since the word of the day is intentional, I think you have to be, you have to design it with the understanding you, you, you can't take for granted the human dynamics that you would have. Uh, learning from watching others becomes very different, right? There used to always be a saying in work, you know, first, first to arrive, last to leave, work hard, lead, lead by example. Now, if you're a new employee, you don't see a lot of that behavior. You don't see how people dress and a lot of these cultural <laughs> dynamics take for granted, but become important part of your onboarding process. So now we have to be intentional about how do you teach the culture and the expectation um, so I see that being a real challenge, but I think, you know, companies who obviously embrace that or perhaps even have training programs already established uh, will do far better about the onboarding and those employees have a better chance of success. Um, or if you don't have those, 
and you're part of a leadership group, I would, I would quickly gather your team and start to address this issue because it's hard to hire good employees always. Um, success generally lives with the leadership and management team that gets them in the door and make sure that they're success and they have the tools to be successful. So I, I think it's an awesome question. Yeah, it is. And I'll, I'll just kind of add on to that. Um, you know, Esri, uh, I won't tell you how many years I am into my career, but I've, I've been around the block a few times. And, um, but even at that, this is, Esri is really only the fourth organization I've worked for in my career. Uh, I think the shortest time I spent at an organization was seven years. And I was obviously with uh, RSI Viz for <laughs> Eight, almost 18 years. So that was a big chunk of my, of my career. Um, and, and one of the things that you notice as you, as you go from organization to organization is the different philosophies on onboarding. Dan mentioned onboarding. Uh, I, I got to be honest, I, was, I have been so impressed with Esri's onboarding process. Everybody goes through Esri boot camp and, and it's not a day, it's not two days, it's nine days, including over a weekend. <laughs> And um, it, you know, some people say it's, it's um, indoctrination. <laughs> Maybe it is, but, but really what, what Esri uh, is trying to accomplish by that is, is to really help people coming into the organization understand what the company ethos is, you know, where that ethos comes from, why it's important to Jack and Laura Dangerman as the founders of the organization. You know, being a privately held, a very large privately held software company, they have a lot more latitude to, to um, set the cultural tone that they want to set. And, and they are very intentional about that. And so a, a big part of that is, you know, teaching their philosophy on, on, on how to do business and how to do it, be successful within the Esri culture. And, and I think it, those kinds of organizations that are good at that will do better at onboarding new talent um, during this time. The only other side of that, though, is the interview process, right? Before you get them into that boot camp, how do you, um, I mean, it's real tempting, again, using that term intentional, it's real tempting to kind of fall back to a skills match approach because it's really hard to get a sense for a person over a Zoom call. Um, so you really have to be, the, the way we've tended to address that so far, we, we haven't had a lot of interviews during this time, but one of the ways that we've addressed that is, is we, we've separated the interview teams up and we have the skills-based interviewers and then we have you know, cultural fit-based interviews where we really try to get to know that person. Um, and, and it's more of an informal discussion like this rather than, well, tell me about, you know, this project you worked on and what language did you write your code in? And it's none of that. It's just, what do you like to do when you're not working? You know, what's important to you? Those are the kinds of things that you're going to have to do to, uh, to ensure cultural fit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny the mention of boot camp actually, because um, again, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking about, you know, in our, culturally anyway, I think um, we rely a lot on this idea of, uh, it has a swear word in it, but, but getting in the dirt, basically, um, when you jump in, right? I mean, being kind of thrown to the sharks and you go through military boot camp, essentially, and it's this shared experience that afterward, everyone feels like you're kind of a part of this community that like, we've all had the same experience and we all have yes. learned the same thing. And again, I, I just think that's a huge challenge. How do you transfer something like that? Um, how do you do that? Yeah, I'll tell you, my experience with Esri Boot Camp is that everybody that I was in boot camp, everybody goes through boot camp. Yeah. Everybody. Senior executives to, to someone straight out of college. Um, you know, the, the group that I went through boot camp with together, because it's intentionally structured, um, to where you are working in teams, even in boot camp, right? And so you, over nine days, you develop uh, some, some interesting relationships. Um, I, I will tell you, everybody that was in my boot camp session, every one of us still keeps in touch. You know, we may, maybe not weekly, but at least once a month, we're exchanging an email, having a conversation. And, and I know that experience has been consistent 
uh, for people on my team who have since gone through boot camp and have said the same thing to me. So I think structuring it so that it's not just a classroom where I'm learning what my job is going to be, what my role is going to be, but putting people in groups to, where they have to collaborate to learn, you, you, that's one of the strategies that I think Ezra uses to keep that, uh, that learning going after they walk out of there. Well, and something like Bootcamp 2 is a really good example of how you continue that knowledge transfer piece. Um, you know, there's a lot of networking and communication goes on. So, for instance, if you're in a boot camp with me, you know, that's an interaction that a lot of times, even in a physical space, might not happen. You know, I think about the fact that I even know you and have any professional relationship with you is purely by chance. I had an office next to his. He moved in and he would walk around and that's, that's how I know Richard. You know, it's... Uh, but I think that when you talk about doing something like a boot camp, it really helps put everyone in that same group. Dan, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, Esri, L3 Harris, we're pretty lucky that we have large organizations that stand behind us and have developed some of those fundamentals over the years. But, you know, I attended one with a previous company, ABB, where they put us through management camp. But one of the biggest lessons that they had for us as managers was, you know, you also have to teach your people to lead themselves. So while we work for two large organizations, there's plenty of other smaller organizations out there that don't have the luxury to formalize a boot camp. Um, so that really means that leadership and management have to become that and uh, be intentional with how they plan to do that, uh, as well as the person too, right? Uh, as individual contributors and employees and professionals, we also have a responsibility to lead ourselves, to go out there and find the information you need to be successful. It's not always the company's responsibility to spoon feed you. Um, so as leaders, right, you have to kind of make those determinations to give your people and teams the tools they need to be necessary but you also want to surround yourself by people who are motivated and hungry to get the information which i like what richard said right like part of that cultural fit is perhaps appetite and desire for knowledge and what are you going to do to help teach yourself the things you need to be successful and if that's part of the program and you formalize it i think that's that's great I agree. What's been the biggest surprise? I'm curious, you know, leadership in these roles, the biggest surprise that's come out of this big shift to remote work. Has it been, were you surprised by the, the efficiency of it? Um, what was the most surprising to you, Dan? Uh, the humanity actually uh, has been the yeah. biggest surprise for me is uh, there's been this natural understanding that people have lives outside of work and all of a sudden, you know, here, I, I'm seeing Ma, Matria's room, I'm seeing your room, I see Richard's background, I learn a little bit more that you don't get in a conference room that's generally pretty sterile. Uh, and the respect that people are giving to one another has been phenomenal, for my opinion, about the humanity and the understanding of, you've been forced to work from home, you have kids and daycare challenges that you didn't have before. And we've all kind of, I think, embraced that with a a really nice understanding that, you know, we're human beings. Yeah. I absolutely would agree with that. I think the, the, um, the humanity, the, just the, the empathy is another word that was, I was thinking of the empathy that people have shown, um, it has been just phenomenal. Yeah. And, you know, another piece of, you know, we've been talking about office, but, Another piece of the physical workspace is also presence at trade shows and conferences and events. Also responsible for a lot of networking and, and community building within our industry. Again, the venue for that is now taken away. Um, it changes the networking and it also changes how we have to think about the way that we communicate our brand values, the way that we communicate our product values, that sort of thing. Uh, Richard, do you want to talk about that? Because I know actually both of our organizations well, are doing the virtual piece right now. Yeah. Uh, pretty big events. Do you want to talk about yours? Yeah, I think we're going to find out real quick how networking works uh, in a virtual, uh, you know, a virtual uh, event uh, world. You know, most of you know, Esri puts on a massive event in San Diego every July. And, um, you know, it, it draws anywhere from 18 to 20,000 people, depending on the year. And, uh, 
it, you know, when you talk to some Esri customers, it is like they plan their whole year around being in San Diego for the users conference. And for those on staff, it is like an absolute badge of honor to be selected to present on stage, to do a session, to actually even be asked to go because, you know, everybody wants to go and we can't, we physically can't take everybody. So it's, it's super important. And, and I think, you know, as you, it, it's one thing to talk about the interaction and the relationships and the, and the human contact between coworkers. When you're talking about uh, a customer, that, that's an even uh, additional layer you have to think about because they, they don't know you like your coworkers may already know you. And so, you, you know, anyway, as we look at the Ezra User Conference, which is coming up in about four weeks now, uh, it has shifted completely to a virtual event. Um, and part of that is the platform that we're using, and don't ask me what it is because I can't remember, <laughs> but if, if you look at the platform we're using, it, it has these virtual rooms where to, uh, to allow you to network, to allow a customer to raise their hand and say, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody about this. And so we're all going to be kind of standing by for when the customer raises their hand and say, hey, we have questions about this. We, we need to know about that. Um, we're going to learn. I honestly don't know how it's going to work, but we're about to find out. And uh, Dan, are you still uh, on board? Are you going to be hosting the virtual event as you hosted the physical event last year? Yeah, it, that's a good question, right? Um, it changes, right? And I'm, I applaud Richard and what Esri's doing because I've seen some of the, uh, as, as a sponsor of the UC, which is one of the best events I've ever been to uh, in our industry for sure. And well, well known throughout the world as being an important event, both from a thought leadership perspective, but networking and, you know, improving ourselves as professionals in the geospatial community. Um, our event is a little different analytics. It's focused on that uh, thought leadership. So smaller sessions. So I think you're going to see a variety of technologies being used that try to support the brand promise, I guess I'll, I'll call it going back to my marketing uh, perspective. Uh, the advantage we have perhaps is both L3 Harris and Esri is right. We already kind of have an established brand promise out there. Um, so people kind of understand what they're going to get in doing so um, as a sponsor of the UC, right? our brand becomes important because there will be a variety of people that may or may not know you. And it's a different when you're walking through a trade show and a sign catches your attention and you can go talk to somebody and you're kind of in that social mode. This will be different, right? Cause you're going to have to be proactive in the things you're seeking out and, and thoughtful, uh, not reactive. So as marketers, right, whether it's point of purchase in a grocery store and your design tries to get somebody's attention, the trade show booth had that very same design behind it. In a virtual world, your logo and other things are going to, it's going to be interesting what comes out is the way to influence and work with customers uh, to engage with you. Well, and, I mean, those are the obvious challenges that come with it. Although I will say that I've heard a few people that always have, you know, trade show booth duty talk about one of the advantages, which is that uh, with the change in how we communicate for virtual trade shows, is uh, you can very easily get out of the conversations in a booth where you're like, okay, and the conversation is done. So moving. Well, now you, just, you can hit a button, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, you so don't have to be super polite and walk away. Yeah. yeah. Well, and your feet won't be killing you at the end of the day either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> your back will be better. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> Matri, do we have any questions that have come up? Yeah, so we do have a question uh, here in terms of, you know, the new generation of, you know, new employees, folks coming out of college, um, you know, they're going to develop their, you know, their career in this new normal environment. Should the older generation, you know, study and prepare themselves for getting ready for this and to compete with the newcomers or should the, you know, the older, uh, you know, folks that have been more seasoned in the industry, you know, fight for coming back to, you know, what we've been used to doing? Uh, I, I'm the older. I, that describes me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, well, Dave, do you want to take this? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the question. I think uh, we have to, as leaders, we have to prepare, prepare ourselves for both. Um, we have to prepare ourselves for going back in an office environment where that 
that makes sense for those employees that can do that. Um, but we also have to be cognizant of onboarding new employees and how you make them be successful in, in learning technology. Because you're right, if I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a new, new employee, I've just accepted a new job, but I can't meet my new manager in person. What is that going to be like? Um, so it's pretty fascinating what we will go through as leaders and doing that. But this whole thing is forcing kind of a, a self-awareness as an organization that you have to be better prepared to help people succeed, I believe. Uh, whether that's the use of technology, a blend of uh, on-premise or in the building, again, will certainly come about. But it's a leader's responsibility, I think, to be flexible and agile and help that person be successful. I agree. It, it, it does fall upon us. And I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a vignette. Um, this actually has nothing to do with geospatial, but I think it really is, it speaks to this topic. So um, one of my other hobbies is I'm a, a road bicyclist. I, I've been riding road bikes for almost 10 years now. And uh, I, I actually had a custom bike built by a company there in Colorado when I was living there. And uh, I recently had a crash and the frame cracked. So I'm talking to them about building a new frame and I'm talking to this young kid. He's the, my sales rep. He's a young guy, a kid. Listen to me. He's probably in his late twenties. And for me, that's a kid, right? <laughs> but what's so funny about this is that I keep sending him emails and he keeps sending me text messages back. <laughs> he just, he's like, don't send me emails. I don't read emails. Just just uh, WhatsApp me or or text me, and so you know for the first for the first several days I kept sending him an emails. Now I finally figured out if I if I want to engage with with this guy I, I've got to send him text messages because email and and actually I'm seeing that you know in my uh, nieces and nephews that are in their 20s and early 30s they just don't do email. That's a silly example, but. It, it does speak to this notion of, you know, we may have to change the way we, we work. We may have to change the way we interact uh, to ways that um, the newer uh, generation, for lack of a better term, coming in uh, is accustomed to working. Yeah, I think it's interesting too because it, you know, there's always a generational shift, you know, to passing the torch, right, from one generation at an organization to the next. And it's always the same kind of challenges that go with it. But right now, I feel like because of the leap forward that we've had to take, mm -hmm. we didn't really have a choice, but, you know, taking this right. leap forward uh, with our work scenario, it almost widens that gap, like the generational gap a little bit of, of passing that torch um, because mm -hmm. it's, it kind of widens the, the difference in how people are used to working a little bit, I think. Yeah, and, and again, not to get overly philosophical, but I think, um, you know, I, I've also been a fairly uh, um, interested student in generational differences in general. I'm a, I'm a baby boomer, right? How does a baby boomer think differently from a Gen X or a Gen Y or a Gen Z or and a millennial and whatever it's coming after millennial? Um, you, you know, my dad used to say, you are you are what you are because of when you were. And, and that's very true. I mean, my experience in the late 60s, early 70s growing up, <laughs> um, radically different than, than the kids coming out of college today that were, that were born, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s even. Um, and, and just appreciating the way they see the world is not necessarily the way I see the world. Um, things have changed radically in terms of, I mean, even when I grew up, we didn't have, we didn't have computers in our schools. The first computer I saw was when I was in college. Um, now they're born and they hand them an iPhone, you know, it's, it's just, and even, even just in terms of, of how things are taught in school, uh, teaching methods have changed and evolved. Uh, societal norms have changed and evolved. So I think we also have to understand those differences well, not just technological, not just technological differences, but uh, cultural and social differences as well. Well, you have to talk about bridging that gap too, not just to the generation maybe coming into the industry, but what about the 
pre new hire generation, right? What about internship programs? Yeah. I mean, what on earth do you do with internship programs? How do you have, yeah. an, how do you have an intern that, you know, their job is maybe getting coffee, but it's all part of learning or whatever. How do you, <laughs> how do you do that when you can't go into the office? It's just the same thing. You have to set them up for success, right? Otherwise, you, the worst thing you can do is get an intern and waste their time, right? That's not the point of an internship. The point of an internship is for them to get value and to learn and become a better qualified potential candidate for your company or for or somebody else's, right? I think companies have that responsibility upon them if you have internships to don't go get coffee. Let's actually teach you something of, of value for yourself that adds value to uh, our organization. So you have to be intentional again about setting them up for success. Um, I think that's a core responsibility of organizations and leaders within the organization. Great. Technology is just part of the platform to help to make that happen. And if you're a millennial and you like text, you know, all right, manager, maybe I'm gonna have to learn how to text perhaps too, uh, what works best to, to build the team and move us forward. So in line with humanity, I think we're also having to learn a lot more about how to better use technology of all sorts to communicate. You know, I haven't seen any blimps yet, but they're coming. Somebody's going to feed, you know, people are outside in parks and it's going to be a better way to reach them. It's okay that they get coffee sometimes, Dan. It's all part well, of the experience. As long as they get one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my um, just general bias there is, uh, well, Internships are hard regardless. I think I, I prefer internships that are more on the technical side of things because it's, it's so much more tangible, the skills that you're trying to transfer to that person. And, and, and because, so like a software engineer, I think a, a software engineering internship is much easier to manage just in normal times and even more so now because you can you can transfer technical knowledge a lot easier in, in these mediums and these forums. Um, you know, we had some internships that we were going to do in the, in the, um, on the business side this year. And we, we actually put those on hold because uh, on, on the business side of things, whether it's sales, marketing, or product management, or any of those kinds of things that really rely on, um, really rely more on, uh, more direct day-to-day -day interaction, um, I, I think those are harder to do. Because one of the things I will tell you, I, I, my days even, my days have always been busy, but they're even more packed now because uh, I'm sitting in central time zone, corporates in, in East Coast. I've got people in Europe, I've got people on the East Coast. So I got things happening when I get up at 6 a.m. and I got things like last night I was on the phone till eight o'clock my day is jammed and it's even harder for me. It would be even harder for me to give an intern that level of attention right now. So that's just Cook's opinion. You know, I think technical internships will, will continue to work great and fine in this environment. I think um, on the business side, it's a little bit harder and you just really got to make sure you've got the, whoever they're assigned to has the bandwidth to actually give them that attention. Yeah. And where I'm curious, where do you guys personally sit in terms of, uh, you know, the potential for us to go back to normal, going back to an office? Where are you on that? Are you on the spectrum uh, that you can't wait to go back to the office? Are you feeling like you would be happy never to go back to the office? <laughs> personally, what are your thoughts on that, Richard? Uh, I'm, I'm coming out of my skin. I am just coming out of my skin. Uh, and, and guys, I'm an introvert. I know, you know, you may not come across that way. My, I've been married for 32 years and my wife has done a fine job of pulling me out of my shell, but my natural tendency is to be an introvert. But I crave that direct face-to-face -face interaction and, con and, and contact. I like sitting across from somebody drinking an espresso and talking about how we're going to uh, implement a new strategy or how we're going to bring a new product to market or, or some new, no, some new idea. The reality is um, it's going to be, um, <laughs> Abby, you would win an arm wrestling contest. Um, <laughs> for, to some extent, I think it's, it's, 
I think we're not going to see normal at all this year. I don't think we're going to see offices repopulated at great, at great volume this year. Uh, I think best case is, is early 2021. And to me, I think that's going to largely be driven by the development of a vaccine for COVID. Uh, I think if we don't have a vaccine starting to roll out in the, in the new year, that um, the, the flow back into the offices will be a lot slower than, than even that. And we may not see full re-engagement until the fall of 2021. So we're, I think we're just all hopeful for a vaccine, you know, to be honest with you. How about you, Dan? How are you feeling? Yeah, I kind of like uh, Richard's timeline. I think that's true. I, I think we're going to look at a blend probably uh, moving from, you know, 80, 20, then we'll go 50, 50, and then we'll look at a 20, 80 scenario over time. Um, I think what will be interesting is now that you've learned who can work from home and who's productive and they raise their hand that that works better for them will be, will the organization say, all right, let's, let's do that. We are willing to change some of our previous policies to allow people who really feel more comfortable working from home until there is a vaccine. Um, we'll kind of change those percentages I talked about, but I kind of see it, this shift and blend over time to get, get us back. Uh, I'm an extrovert. I miss the office. I miss my airplane seat. I miss, you know, seeing customers in person. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing that, but I have to be <laughs> patient, right? I heard somebody, an article the other day talked about, you know, America, can we pass the marshmallow test? And they're worried, you know, if you're familiar with the marshmallow test, right, they put the marshmallow in front of the kid and they say, if you don't eat this in the next five minutes, I'll come back and I'll give you five. Well, most of the time the kid eats the marshmallow and doesn't get the five right and I think for extroverts like myself you know if we can hold off that's probably better uh, but some of us are going to eat the marshmallow and go out yeah. I think it says a lot about who you are really as a person <laughs> if you would be the person I'm not even going to comment on whether I would eat it right away but we, we know we know you would eat the marshmallow Abby no rewards are better immediately right <laughs> I, I'm with you. I, I'm ready to be on an airplane again, but that's that's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Okay. I, but I do think, Dan, to your point, I do think, and, and, and this conversation is already starting to happen within Esri, is that even after we're back in the office, um, there, there are jobs, roles, people that uh, this this event has shown that it works very well for them. It makes them a more productive employee. And I do think organizations are gonna change their philosophy on work from home. And you're gonna see a little bit more of a blend. We may see some folks that never, you know, have an assigned office back in a building again. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the polls that we do during this, besides determining that I would obviously win in an arm wrestling match, uh, the, one that we <laughs> the one that we did last week uh, when Bo was on, uh, asked, you know, the same question that I just asked you guys. And ultimately, the overwhelming, whoops, the overwhelming response that we got was people would prefer a hybrid. They prefer, they prefer something that was a little bit of both, a little bit in the office, you know, a little bit at home. So it doesn't necessarily need to be that black and white, I think. Yeah, okay. so that's an interesting point, Abby. I'll just say, you know, there's, I forget what pod, I was listening to a podcast recently and um, I can't remember what podcast it was, but um, the, um, oh, and I've, I've even completely lost, uh, Steve Coogan, the actor Steve Coogan from the UK was talking and, and he was making the point um, that, you know, a lot of topics, a lot of issues and topics that we discuss in our society today are, are nuanced, but we don't treat them as nuanced. And um, he and this was actually recorded before the COVID outbreak. So it was somewhat uh, interestingly foretelling. But um, I think that hybrid, it, that's a nuanced kind of conversation. You've seen a lot of people point out that now that there are more people working at home, uh, CO2 emissions are down, right? The, the air is clearing up. Um, uh, you know, if we really want to talk about uh, uh, combating climate change and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, having people work from home more is, is a great way to do that. I, th I think if you, 
if you straddle the line, <laughs> you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to get the benefit of either side. So I think you're going to have to, you're going to have to make choices. And I think uh, a lot of times we don't want to make those choices. We don't want to make those trade-offs, but we, we're going to have to. And I think, uh, plus, if you look at it from the business standpoint, why am I going to pay for a building that has 100,000 square feet if it's only being utilized at 50% capacity? And if you think about that, if you think about the, you know, that's highly inefficient for the business. It's, it's not a, a, an effective use of capital. And then if you keep pulling on that thread and you say, okay, well, they'll just, they'll just lease a separate, a smaller building. Well, that's great. But now you're talking about economic contraction, right? So you have to think about, you have to pull the different layers of the onion back and think about the nuances of, of that conversation and that discussion uh, when you talk about it. So I guess what you're saying is that if you were my boss, I shouldn't be that excited about getting to work from home forever is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, no, I would, I'm just saying, um, take, pick a, pick a path and, and stick to it. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're productive working at home, you enjoy working at home and it meets the needs of the business, continue to work at home, knock yourself out. Perfect. Awesome. Do it. Um, but in the next breath, don't ask me to keep an office for you so that you can come in one or two days a week because that's not, I'm, I'm, that's not effective use of capital. You know what's really interesting, I just, I just had a thought, is that in previous generations, there was this uh, cultural split between you know, people that were working and, and management, right? The, or with police officers, like the guys in uniform versus the guys in suits. And I almost wonder if uh, the ability to work from home and working remotely is gonna become the new standard for, you know, you know what I mean? That's for people above a certain level. All the other jobs are too tactical. They have to, they have to be in the office. They have to show up. I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't think so? No. I don't. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just be brief on this because I've been speaking a lot the last few minutes. Um, you know, I would say that, that the notion of what a management role is is radically different than what it was when I entered the workforce in 1980-something. Uh, <laughs> um, to me, uh, you know, even as the, I have a title, I'm a corporate director, I'm, I'm a director at, at Esri Corporation, uh, but I am, I am not just sitting in my chair having meetings, philosophizing, strategizing, I'm actually writing product strategy briefs. I'm writing product plans. I'm I'm doing, I'm doing the same work that most of the people on my team are doing, except for actually writing code because that would be dangerous. Uh, it, it's it's just not the same anymore. I think being in a leadership or a management role, uh, that has that dynamic has changed. I mean, I know there's still some organizations where that hierarchy and and traditional segregation of duties exists. But I think even in those organizations, that's going to fade away over time. You think, Dan? Um, yeah, and I'm going to try to wrap my answer to a question that one of the people in the uh, webinar asked about. Do we think working from home will change wages? I don't think it will. I think actually, you know, organizations, as Richard talked about, have to now evaluate the talent that's available to them, because now it's a global, truly probably global environment and pool to look from. Uh, yes. You want to be competitive. You, you want your people to be paid well, uh, to be successful and like what they do. So I don't think if more people work from home, that necessarily drives wages down. But Richard pointed out something I hadn't thought about before, which is, you know, office space. Obviously, if we tend to blend and reduce our footprints, the economic impact on them is one thing, uh, but there's also, hadn't thought about it, right? I came from an energy efficiency software company not too long ago where we sold and managed to help organizations with what we call green tags, right? Which is their, their contribution to a better world. All of a sudden, Richard just brought up the idea that perhaps keeping people to work from home a little bit more is their contribution to a better planet and energy efficiency. That's right. And could you count that? Uh, that'll be, that will be interesting. Perhaps you could. That is well, Esri, Esri, I'm sorry, Abby, Esri is an interesting organization because, you know, Jack as our founder is also an avid conservationist and he puts his money where his mouth is. Every Esri building is fully self-sustained with solar power. Yeah. He doesn't, 
and he, he tends, with a few rare exceptions, he tends to own all of his office buildings for that very reason, so that he can con control that. So uh, that has absolutely been a part of the conversation we've been having is, you know, does, does having more people work from home do even more for uh, reducing Esri's environmental impact than just, you know, making sure that we're, we're um, renewable energy uh, fueled and, and not dependent upon, you know, uh, dirty energy. Yeah. Sorry, I had myself muted there. Uh, you know, the, the environmental footprint is, it's something that we've covered extensively on this show, you know, because it's such, it's such a visible thing, you know, with people in this geospatial imagery, that's what we do. We look at change and we look at change detection. Uh, so I don't think anyone can deny that there's indeed a correlation there and it would be really cool to see something uh, change that way going forward with what Dan was just talking about. Definitely. Um, you know, we're getting really close to the time. I would say, are there any thoughts that you'd like to add, either one of you? Maybe questions for each other, anything like that? Um, I actually had one for Richard um, that I was thinking about. You know, Richard, who, who was a great leader you worked for or helped mentor you early in your career? that young people should consider some of the attributes you got in your experience? Well, I mean, you know, the answer to that it immediately pops into my mind. It was a, when I was uh, right out of college, I went to work for um, a large defense contractor, Lockheed Martin. And um, I had a, a, a fantastic leader mentor there by the name of Juan Sandoval. Juan Sandoval was, uh, was the chief engineer of uh, the F-16 aircraft program. And he took me under his wing and, and uh, you know, he really empowered me to do things well beyond my years of experience. And, uh, and, and yeah, I created resentment with some of, the, some of the folks that were, that went before me, but he just did a phenomenal uh, job of, of uh, showing me the way. And, and then the unique thing that he did was he also encouraged me to go back to school and get my MBA while I was doing that. So I was getting book learning and I was getting practical learning at the same time. And then I'll never forget it, uh, like a week after I got my MBA, he took me to lunch and said, now quit. I said, excuse me, he said, you, you need to quit this job. You need to go get some different experience. You need to go find a commercial organization, a startup or something along those lines. And of course me, I'm a, okay, sure, whatever. And that's what I did. I, I quit uh, an organization where I could have had a 35 year career and, and retired with a pension and I went to a startup and it absolutely changed my trajectory. Um, so he was a very unconventional mentor and, and, and and just, you could tell his sincerity right off the bat. You could tell he was intentionally investing in me. Why? I have no idea. But he intentionally invested in me. And that's what you look for, right? You look for somebody that's not just checking the box on their, their to-do list. You can tell, and you can tell, it's, you can tell that they're genuinely interested in helping you and investing their personal energy and time. Uh, and Juan Sandoval, it, he's since passed, but boy, um, he definitely changed my life. I think that's true of a lot of us. I think, you know, we had at different kinds of jobs and different levels of jobs. We had someone that actually took an interest in what we were doing and that's what makes a good manager. And I think that that mentorship doesn't have to change, you know, now that we shift our work environment, it's still just as essential. And I think that a good manager will make it work. What about you? I don't know if we have time, Dan, but what yeah. about you? Um, you know, I, uh, I feel fortunate that it was my father. Um, he had started a business when I was in middle school and high school in our basement and grew it to be successful. So I got to see him be an entrepreneur, but also to become a leader. And he was a, an IBM engineer. He was as introverted as you could possibly be, um, but sincere and authentic in his own personal qualities. So I was very lucky to see that. Um, but he told me something very similar, Richard, to your mentor, you know, eventually within the family business, he's like, it's time for you to go leave. <laughs> you need to go learn from somebody else and have other experiences. Um, 
but he was invested in my success and he understood that that may not be best for me to stay there to continue my career and continue the things I was interested in going out to do. So I was very lucky and I've had great managers and bosses and CEOs who I've worked for. So, uh, you know, with my own kids, I tell them, worry less about your first job, worry more about your first mentor. Because I think that's going to change you more than whatever job you end up getting. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. If we had more time, we're really coming up against that that hour time limit. Otherwise, I'd make Matria uh, go through the same exercise, and probably she would force me to also answer the same question. Uh, but because we're running up against the time, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, you know, this has been great. This is an awesome conversation. I always say thanks and I always really mean it. You know, thanks for coming on to our panelists. I know that you guys are, you're busy people with those big titles that you've got. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys coming on. And to the audience, uh, you know, thank you. And I just want to remind you that you can watch the recordings of this episode and others again at harrisgeospatial.com slash geospatial distancing. And we'll be taking a few weeks off uh, before our next live episode. But we'll stay, you know, stay tuned because we'll be back with more of them. I'm just considering it. Uh, I'm not in school anymore, so I don't get a summer break. This is my few weeks summer break, right? That's how I'm treating it. So until next week, I want you to consider that one of the biggest differentiators between the heroes and the villains in this world is the ability to extend the reach of your empathy beyond the walls of your own home. You guys have a good well said. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.